me. Um, so we, we really want feedback. We want to understand what's working, what's not working, and you know areas of, of where you think that we can provide value to you guys. Um, I want to hand it over to Brian and Bob. Uh, they're going to handle the meat of this presentation and talk about the science of Bovida and, and what that means to the cannabis and talk about their experience of packaging different materials for, I think combined, they probably have about 75 years of experience. Um, lots of really cool stuff to hear from them. And then we'll kind of circle back and we'll talk about how the technology can impact you as farmers or brands. And then um, we're working on a really cool nonprofit this harvest season that we're hoping we can get some involvement from HCGA and the Emerald County farmers and distro companies. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit at the end and give you guys a link to sign up for anyone who's interested. Um, Brian, if you wanna go ahead and take it from here, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> hey, thanks a lot guys for, for having us. Um, I'm sharing my screen, so I just want to, if you guys can give me a thumbs up that you can see uh, Bob and I, the mug shots there. All right, so I'm running the master copy. We're going to tag team this, and Ryan is going to close it out. So, um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction, Ryan, and thanks for having us, guys. Uh, so uh, I guess a little, uh, little bio between Bob and I. Bob's... Uh, He's in a little bit more relaxed position over here. It looks like there might be a lake uh, in his uh, background here. But um, yeah, so Bob is, uh, you know, retired General Mills 94, co-founder and inventor of Bovida. Uh, he recently, last year, uh, got nominated as a Minnesota State icon for what he does, not only for the community, but for the state, for small businesses. Uh, he's a mentor. He's a leader uh, around the, the area. Uh, he's got uh, quite a few patents under his belt. So, um, I'm trying to catch up to him, but he just keeps going. So it's, uh, it's definitely riding the coattails. And then for myself, um, I've got about 20 years of packaging product innovation, uh, arranging a lot of different companies. And I've been at Bovida for about three, three years, actually three years this month. So um, with that, um, I'm going to go to the next slide and then uh, Bob will take it away. Okay, thanks, Brian. This is exciting to have a virtual audience out here and uh, really appreciate the opportunity here. I, all I have is a front end fluff here and uh, Brian will get into the detail here, but I've been working as an engineer in the packaging industry and packaging machinery consumer products area for about 60 years now. So I'm an old man here, but I'm still active in doing things here. I started with a uh, bachelor's degree in physics and uh, took it a variety of directions here. So uh, in when I retired from General Mills in 1994, I started a consulting business and uh, Dr. Al Sari and I, who was a uh, chemist from General Mills, uh, and I were, did some consulting work together. And uh, one day in 1995, he called me and said he'd gotten a call from a friend who had some cigars that they had put in a, in a uh, humidor that he had made out of dry wood. And the darn cigars sucked, the wood sucked all the water out of the cigars and he was pretty unhappy about it. And Dr. Sari said, oh, it's no big problem, big deal. I can solve that. And so he went in the kitchen and took salt from the kitchen uh, salt shaker and mixed it with water. And lo and behold, it created 75% relative humidity. So then, of course, he said, well, I got to put it into something. And so he called me and said, I need some help on the packaging. And so I said, sure, no big deal. And so I started working on it. And um, I suspect... Uh, what we needed was a package that had a high water vapor permeability. The water vapor had to be able to evaporate out of there and it had to, had to hold a liquid, which is not an easy combination here. And so we started the search for looking for alternate materials and I found some that were kind of interesting. So we filed a patent and uh, we had that in Washington and uh, this David Bergstedt who had brought the problem to us said, why don't we start a business? Because he had been talking to some of the tobacco companies about what it was, there was a need for this. And he, they found out there sure was. So uh, we, 
Dr. Sari and I talked about what our roles would be in the company. And it was interesting. We both are technical people. We said, no way did we want to be in sales. We didn't want to manage. We didn't want to market the product. We didn't want any of that. We just wanted to handle the target side, the, uh, the uh, technical side of things. So uh, in July 1997, exactly, and I don't know why this happened today, but it's 23 years ago today, we formed the company. And there were six founders. And uh, two of them had experience in sales and marketing and a few things down that direction. So they became the president and vice president of the company. So there are six of us founders and uh, we started our, our operation in a, uh, somebody's, uh, I guess probably their dining room is where it started. And uh, along the way, I was uh, doing my diligence on the packaging part of it. And I suspect I investigated and pursued about a hundred different materials before I found one that was, uh, was reasonably good. And uh, that, that, was, that was a rough haul all the way along there because uh, we were trying to show products to people, show to our customers, and uh, we, we just didn't have very good execution of that. So next slide, I guess. So our, our package, uh, if you haven't seen it or felt it, it's all it is is paper on the outside and then it has a vapor phase in the middle, a, a membrane, and then inside are all natural ingredients. So it's salt, water, and gum is what we put together. And uh, it's patented in the United States. We currently have nine patents and it's ISO, our plant is ISO certified and every ingredient we use in there is FDA approved, safe. And uh, we also have the GMP uh, uh, stamp on our stuff that, that goes through that plant. Next, uh, what, what it is is a two-way humidity controller. And what that means is whatever the number is on the package is what you will get in the headspace surrounding that pouch. So if you have it in a closed container and you have your product in there and it's got, you've got the 62% product in there, this pouch will take your product and as long as you have the ratio of product to package to product, right? Uh, will will either add water or take it away as needed. And it'll keep it at the 62% very, very close to that. So the water vapor passes through and that's pure water vapor. It's, a, it's an RO water, which means reverse osmosis water. And uh, it'll, it'll, uh, by, it'll emerge out or it will be absorbed in depending on what it is. So uh, it's not a one way, you know, you hear about desiccants and all desiccants do is try to absorb water. You get one in your pair of shoes sometimes when you buy them. Well, that's, it's kind of a worthless application because it's wide open the elements. But anyway, uh, what a desiccant does is, ex is just absorb, absorb, absorb. That's what it does. And humidifiers are the other, other way. There, there are some pack packages in the marketplace that have a wet pad inside of a package and all it does is give off moisture. So it's trying to create 100% relative humidity, but it doesn't quite make it obviously. So you get a lower number, but you never know, never know what you're gonna get. Next. So what, what I just talked about is it's precise, it's accurate, and speed is something, and I don't know, Brian may talk about it later, but this, this membrane that we've got, uh, you know, if you, if, you know, I know I don't want to get into a lot of technical stuff here in, in the packaging side of things, which is my, my exciting area, but, uh, you know, like if you had a box of cereal on your shelf and at home and the packaging material inside there would be would be in our units would give up like uh, 0.2 grams, 100 square inches in, in 24 hours. That's the rate of moisture transfer. This film that we have is up in the 60. So it's, it's major multiple uh, of what, what a standard material might be such as a cereal liner. So this, this is interesting from the standpoint uh, we have a saturated salt solution and the key word there is saturated. We have an excess amount of salt. So if you hold our pouch in your hand, you might find some excess salt down, you know, solids down at the bottom of it. And that is critical so that when you see on the, on the slide here that as the pouch for 75% here, for example, uh, as it gives up moisture, 
it stays right at 75%. And that is extremely unique within these kinds of products. And it, it has to have a saturated salt solution in order to achieve that. So uh, it either gives off moisture or absorbs it either way. So it'll keep it at 75%. And uh, one of the ways that uh, you can, you know, oh, I guess I'll wait for that. Go ahead. Next slide. So water activity is critical. You need to understand this concept. And if you look at the right there, the water activity of some uh, various materials. Uh, I'm change my screen here so I can see it. Uh, you know, obviously the things fresh out of the out of the field are going to be extremely high. So uh, a uh, cannabis plant, for instance, would be right up the 1.9 to 1 range as you picked it in the field. And so you're going to dry it down. And so, you know, flour and uh, rice, things like that are uh, probably dried down to about 0.8. And uh, the cannabis needs to be dried down to about 0.6 in that range. And, and the reason is on the left of that chart is the bacteria that can grow. And you have to be down below the 0.6 in order to be safe. So 0.65 and below is, is it. And water activity uh, determines whether or not these things can grow. It's not moisture content. Moisture content is a different number. So uh, there'll be a slide next, but uh, water activity means that we're measuring only the free water on that slide. Free water is what is, can interact and cause the microbes to grow, the mold, whatever it might be. The bound water is inside the stem and is locked up. So when you do a moisture analysis, you're getting both those numbers. And it's an interesting number and we criticize moisture content because if you run a standard moisture Senko or whatever the instrument might be, you're going to be driving off some volatiles as well as measuring both the bound water and the free water. Well, if you're concerned about the stability of your product and how well it's going to hold up over time and not be a safety issue, uh, you need to know what the water activity is, how much free water was in that product. And that's kind of the the uh, base of our concept for our technology and uh, the water activity meter is something that we use every day, multiple times a day, just to measure products. So uh, I think I probably already covered that. So probably your turn now, Brian. All right, sorry, I was on mute. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Bob. What is it? chat here somebody's birthday happy anniversary bob it's it's a it's the it's uh Boba's birthday yeah Boba's we, birthday. we just celebrated our 23rd uh yeah anniversary this month so um that's awesome that's great um all right so thanks a lot bob um, so i'm going to uh continue on this water activity and why is uh water activity or what we call relative humidity a better measurement to determine what cannabis safety is and not moisture content. Um, and the way I like to describe this to people is uh, measuring the water activity or the relative humidity is like measuring to the nearest millimeter um, and measuring moisture content is like measuring to the nearest inch. Uh, water activity and relative humidity really get fine tuned and, and dial in that microscope if you would and tell you whether or not your your weed is in a safe zone or if it's a bad zone. There's too much ambiguity uh, in a big range that moisture content can have. Um, so if you understand that, if you if we say, all right, we're going to look at moisture content or at water activity, um, we have to understand that the Cannabis Safety Institute uh, several years ago took a lot of cannabis samples and they measured microbial growth along a spectrum of different humidity levels. And they understood and found that from a microbial standpoint, uh, 0.65 or 65% uh, relative humidity is where mold started to grow. So they deemed at that point, um, anything above that or wetter would uh, experience uh, microbial growth. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, it's just a, a quick graph showing you that um, this arrow is pointing to the safe zone of where you wanna be in for your cannabis.
Uh, that information was then parlayed. Bob and I and uh, a, a couple of other uh, people within Boda worked with ASTM at, to establish that that water activity in the safe zone for all different types of uh, cannabis and testing within that range uh, to ensure that uh, you know safe weed is provided uh, to our customers. Um, so let me inter let me interrupt. Go back to that uh, slide if you can. Uh, one of the ways to understand water activity is that it is the relative humidity right adjacent to the product. So if you had a container that was sealed with your product in it and you stuck a hygrometer down into that container, you would measure the relative humidity in that container with the product controlling the atmosphere. And that would be water activity. It's kind of a clearer way maybe of thinking about it. So water, it's a relative humidity adjacent to your product. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Bob, for that clarification. Okay, so let's change gears a little bit. Um, now that we've kind of grounded you on uh, water activity, relative humidity, moisture content, uh, and why that's very important, let's start to understand uh, the three big things that can evaporate with cannabis. And the three big ones are terpenes, moisture and weight, uh, and then also, believe it or not, cannabis quality and your brand reputation can evaporate. I'll dig into each one of these a little further as we get into these slides. Um, so, and I might be speaking to the choir, but um, just to ground everybody to make sure, you know, if we start to understand the evaporation of terpenes and we look at the trichome and the head of the trichome, uh, there's a lot of things going on, but the majority of the terpenes primarily reside within the trichome, and not only within that trichome, within the trichome head. So you've got uh, some cannabinoids and terpenes, uh, some type of a wax layer that's covering this. Um, so if we understand, you know, where that tri where the majority of the terpenes reside in that trichome head, uh, let's try to prevent evaporation. So, um, so let's look at a couple pictures that I've got here. Um, and this is a zoomed up version uh, of, I, I don't recall the strain, uh, but this is what it looks like after 10 to 12 days. This could be um, at the dry, or maybe the cure, but if you see the trichomes, um, the stalks are pretty good, uh, nice and straight. Um, uh, and and the, the head of the trichome is actually still intact and nice and, uh, nice and round, nice and bulbous. Um, now, look, now look at one month uh, without, without humidity control as evaporation continues uh, that trichome starts to twist, starts to dry up more, and now you can barely recognize a trichome head. And what's happening here is that evaporation of water and terpenes, and um, all, all your cannabinoids are starting to uh, evaporate um, outside of the, the outside of the uh, the trichome head. And this is just at one month. Uh, now at two month uh, 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 progression of, ev of evaporation. Uh, these trichomes are not even distinguishable anymore. Uh, severe evaporation has happened, water, terpenes. Uh, this looks like really horrible bud. Your trichomes are gonna fall off. We're talking about crumble. Uh, we're talking about uh, really dry keep, the stuff that's gonna fall off of your buds and fall into the bottom of that container. So when consumers get it, uh, all that dust is gonna be down there um, and not very presentable. So, um, so how do we, how do we understand this a little further? And hopefully these animations are coming through for you guys. Um, uh, my marketing department uh, did an excellent job of uh, putting this uh, little video together, but um, on the head of that trichome, this is showing how much can evaporate, where that water is evaporating from, where those terpenes are evaporating. Uh, and, and you've got all these molecules that are continuously going to evaporate without any humidity control. So, if you think about it, you know, try to ensure that you've got a hearty, hearty and, and, and healthy trichome that's not brittle, it's not fragile, uh, it's not lost its potency. Uh, and, with, and, and in order to do that, you need to keep it within this range of 55 to 65. It it's, keeps it very flexible. Um, and, you know, then you're gonna preserve the cannabis, right? So the left-hand side is obviously a really dry trichome and on the right hand side is the ideal what you want to get to so um so now we understand like terpenes uh evaporating and and how they evaporate and what it can look like and what could be the 
the, the impact onto the buds in your container. Um, let's understand how do you prevent the evaporation from occurring. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that this comes through as well to you guys. Um, but what this animation is, is, is a zoomed up version, if you would, of the trichome head. And what it's showing is uh, the evaporation of water, uh, terpenes uh, are just being evaporated off. And what, what can happen when you store it within that range of 55 and 62% is what we are calling it a monolay of water that kind of protects um, over that trichome head and it stops that evaporation from happening. Um, what, I, what I try to tell people is, is essentially, uh, you know, you're putting a, a shield or a helmet over that trichome head and it just locks in all those terpenes uh, until the time the consumers uh, um, grind it, smoke it, or whatever, uh, whatever else they're going to consume it. So you want to keep that locked in and prevent that evaporation using this monolayer. Um, so, but this does not come um, with a change, change in mindset. Uh, and what's going to happen as that monolayer is formed around the trichome head is that uh, you're not going to get that big smell, that big nose hit when you open up a container that's been properly stored within that range. And I can tell you that's good. That means evaporation of that bud, of those trichomes have not occurred. It's still locked in. So that absence of smell in that container is actually good. You wanna keep that there. Um, and then that also tells you that this monolayer of water has stopped, has, has been um, formed and it has prevented evaporation. And then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, some bovida studies that we've done both internally here using hemp and we've also done some studies externally uh, in California uh, and in Washington, um, but um, We've, we've shown that once this monolayer is formed, where there is no, uh, the, the evaporation of terpenes is, is halted, it's stopped, uh, and it keeps them hydrated and prevents oxidization. So um, this slide is, is uh, going to show you uh, what a test, what are the tests that we performed, uh, just order intensity of ground weed versus unground weed. And on the left-hand side uh, is, is a smell intensity range from low to high. And on the bottom, is we've got different RH levels that we've tested. Um, we brought weed to these uh, RH levels and then smelled uh, or had a third party test um, actually determine the smell intensity of weed versus unground. So you can see unground weed at 53%, which is below that 55, um, has a pretty good smell to it. Um, but as um, you get closer to this 62%, um, or even at this 55, that monolayer water has started to form and that smell intensity in the container has gone down. And that's good. That means that that evaporation has not occurred, is still within the weed. So let's look at what happens when I take that exact same sample of weed um, that's at, at these RH levels and then I ground them. And you can see a tremendous difference in the smell and nose hit coming off of this cannabis um, once you've then grounded, no scent, everything has been the same. The, the strain has been uh, exactly the same. It's just at different RH levels. So as you see, as that water level, the RH levels of the trichome or the weed starts to increase, the difference between ground and unground weed smell is just phenomenal as you get higher and higher. Um, and that, that tells you that the monolayer has been formed. So, one thing I want to let you guys understand is um, evaporation can happen anywhere at, at any time. And this is just a, a typical snapshot of maybe a, a supply chain where you're, you're a grower, you produce, you harvest, uh, you're cured, quality analysis, you package, you, you know, you tend a truck, it's in a retail package, compliance labeled, uh, retail, and then the end user gets it. We're looking at almost what six different, ten different uh, time points of where this could evaporation could occur. In reality, is this could be three to six months or even longer. But what most important is is once it leaves your guys' hands after that harvest and drying and curing, all these steps evaporation can still occur. So if you cure at the right RH level and it's at the best opportunity to smoke that weed. Once it leaves your hand without humidity control, evaporation can occur that you don't, you can't control. So 
uh, that's, that's, that can be a big problem. So I wanted to show you guys another example of evaporation of not just water and, and, and the terpenes, but um, we all know that we eat is still sold by the weight, right? Water is weight. So let's look at a specific example here. I have on the left-hand side, um, I've got a thousand pounds, thousand pounds of weed that's at 50% RH, relative humidity. And let's just say it's at five, five dollars per gram. Without humidity control, what can happen is it can drop. The weight can drop. So now we're looking at a 45% drop in humidity. That's evaporation. Now look at this revenue difference. Thousand pounds at five dollars per gram. Just a five percent drop in relative humidity can equate to almost fifteen thousand dollars lost due just to water evaporation. That's just weight. Just a five percent drop. That's astounding. So let's look at the opposite of this. So same example. Uh, you've got wheat uh, that's at fifty percent humidity again. <clears> thousand <throat> pounds at five dollars per gram. What happens if you increase that to within that range of 65 uh, to 55 and we hold it at 62%? You're gonna rehydrate this. Now, the interesting thing is, is that monolay of water is gonna form around those trichomes, like I mentioned earlier. You're gonna bring up the RH uh, to 12% and below that 65% to prevent mold uh, from occurring. Now let's look at this just on a pure revenue standpoint. A 12% increase in RH at this thousand pounds is almost $48,000 just gaining revenue. Now this is just water. This is water moving in and out of these uh, cannabis samples and, and of this. So you can see that in this example, a thousand pounds can now be um, 1,014 pounds uh, on average. So uh, just by adding humidity control and keeping it safe. So that's it uh, for me, guys. Uh, and then uh, Brian is going to pick up and close it out. And then we'll open it up for questions. Cool. Thanks, Rob and Brian. Um, I'm going to go through my slides real quick. And then, yeah, anyone who has questions, post them in the chat. We'll, we'll follow up with you. And then we'll talk about um, this nonprofit endeavor that's where we're working on this harvest season. Um, but I think it's important that you guys know that but well, I didn't go search out the cannabis industry to make a quick buck, like a lot of these companies that are trying to rush into the green rush. Um, like, like we talked about earlier, today's our 23rd birthday. We've been in business for a long time, um, but we've actually been working with the cannabis space for almost 15 years now. Um, we, we had a gentleman who was uh, importing flour and he was having significant lace, weight loss that was happening during um, transport. I don't know. How many of you are familiar with farmer pounds, but that used to be how it was up on the hill was, you know, that the, some flour is going to get lost before it got to the end consumer. So you, you throw in that extra, you know, quarter ounce or half ounce to, to make sure that you don't get that call saying, Hey, this is short. Um, well, that adds up, especially when you were talking about thousands of pounds, like Brian said. And so he found this solution to, to weight loss and uh, you know, reached out to us and we, we understood that it wasn't as simple as just um, providing them with a product that we already had. We had to do some testing to figure out what the ideal RH levels are for storing cannabis to make sure that, you know, we wouldn't be ruining any of the product that went out. Um, and so we've kind of taken a leading edge on doing a lot of the studies with different groups on how water activity affects cannabis, how moisture content affects cannabis, and what that means for the quality and bottom line for, for you guys. Um, you know, Humboldt County, you guys have the reputation worldwide as being a, a, a premier producer of cannabis. Um, and um, as legalization continues nationally and internationally um, and cannabis commerce opens up, people are gonna wanna buy Humboldt cannabis, just like they wanna buy Napa Valley wine, just like they want to buy Cuban cigars. I mean, this is a lot of the stuff that I hear in these group meetings, talking about Appalachians, talking about craft growing techniques, talking about the experience and the genetics and everything that makes your cannabis unique, 
compared to corporate cannabis or, or cannabis that's not produced in, in this area of the world. And, you know, it's really important that uh, all of that experience, Appalachian genetics, all those things are protected so that when your flower reaches the end consumer, they're still having that elevated experience over they would over something that's, you know, basically corporate grown cannabis. And if you're not packaging with humidity control, you're losing the ability to control, uh, to have a, a consistent experience for your consumers. Yeah, go ahead, next, next slide, Brian. Um, and so Boveda's got a reputation as well. Um, just like Humboldt, Boveda has a reputation for being the best. Um, top companies, um, Fender Guitars, uh, Sub-Zero Refrigerators, Rolls-Royce, all of those brands uh, use Boveda for humidity control. And the thing that all of those brands have in common is they are the best of the best in the industry that they're in. And to think that Rolls-Royce couldn't look at any humidity control product that's on the, the market and choose from anything. And the fact that they chose Boveda, I think shows a lot about our technology and you know the value and the, the brand recognition that Boveda has as well. Um, next slide. And so, you know, what does that mean to you guys? Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I've talked to cigar shop owners or people who are cigar smokers who have walked into a store and they've bought a cigar simply because it was packaged with Boveda. They maybe didn't know the cigar, they didn't know the brand, but what they did know was that that product was going to arrive to them fresh and in the optimal level that it is. And that's what consumers have, have learned to know about Boveda is that when they're buying a product that's packaged with Boveda, it's always gonna reach them in the optimal condition and they're gonna be able to you know, experience the, the full array of all the benefits that that product has. And so for cultivators, that means that your, your flower quality is gonna be better, distro is gonna be able to move through your product faster. If they're not able to move through your product, one of the biggest concerns that I've heard from cultivators is product being returned back from distributors and then that product being in suboptimal shape uh, or not the same shape that it was when it left to go to the distributor. You know, putting a bovida in each one of those pounds is going to help ensure that even if that flower gets returned to you, it's still going to be in good enough shape that you're going to be able to get a good price for it. Um, for the distro companies, you guys are going to be stopping the evaporation that's happening during um, storage. Um, the other thing that we've seen for, for manufacturing, uh, I've seen people who are doing pre-rolls and jarring and other thing that have had close to a 5% loss rate on the amount of flour. And a lot of that was just because the flour was overly dried. And when it went through their automated equipment, they were having flour that was dusting up and keefing and basically um, just losing too much to the consistency of the way the flower was. We've seen decreases of, you know, about a 5% loss rate to about a 2% loss rate in, in a couple of different examples, and, and it adds up. And, and lastly, for the retailers, the consumers are gonna have a better consistent experience, which is gonna create that strong reputation for your brand, um, the store, and it's gonna create a loyal customer base. Um, last one. So, what we're doing with the HCGA um, this harvest season is, is a couple unique initiatives. Um, so besides just us sitting here and, and trying to um, tell you about the advantages of the technology, we want to get you guys the opportunity to see the advantages for yourself. And so we came up with this Boveda Challenge Kit. The idea of this Boveda Challenge Kit is that you just take two separate containers, you store uh, one with uh, the same flower in both containers, one with the Boveda and one without. And then after a certain period of time, you just do a smell and flavor profile side by side. Um, and then secondly, um, I think there was a question in the chat asking about what the ideal water activity meters are. Um, we want to offer free water activity testing and, um, you know, I'll come out to any of the farms that are looking for information on how they're um, terpene preservation techniques are doing, if there's things that they can do to uh, maybe get better in what they're doing and seeing if they're leaving any money on the table. Uh, this is the, the scope of most of the science and Boveda part of the presentation. 
I just wanted to see if there was any questions that anyone had before we kind of got into um, the stuff that we're doing with MedVets and the nonprofit work. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. This has been an amazing presentation. Um, if you guys have questions, we can start a stack or you can ask a question in the Zoom chat feature. All right, so I will just go and if I see any questions come up, we'll try to address them as they come in. Um, but uh, Boveda is gonna be working with uh, Big Jake from MedVeds on a really cool initiative this harvest season to uh, help raise uh, cannabis for veterans. And so we're asking all of you guys who, who might be interested in involving uh, or being involved to um, you know, reach out to us and um, see if you can support us. What we're, what we're looking for is about 50 farms to work with and we're asking for um, a, a pound of flour as a donation. Uh, under SB 34, all of the flour that's donated will be a tax write-off to the farms that we're working with. And the flour is gonna help um, veterans with their medicinal benefits of the flower, but it's also gonna help with opportunity housing and meaningful employment opportunities that we're working on. Um, on top of the donation and that you guys are making to this cool cause, Bovid is gonna be chipping in some really cool stuff too. And I'm gonna let Jake talk a little bit more about MedVets and what they're doing after I, I get to this. Um, but Part of this is we don't just want to raise uh, the flower. We also want to understand um, how those terpenes and how those different cannabinoids are affecting the veterans and the end users and make sure that the medicinal value of the plant is being preserved all the way from harvest until those consumers get it. So they're able to have consistency with their medicine. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a terpene degradation study with a small amount of the flower that's donated. Um, with one of the local labs up there. We're gonna take about a half ounce or, of every pound that's donated. We're gonna take a terpene baseline for all those samples at the time of intake. And then we're gonna be taking different measurements. We're looking at possibly 30, 90, and maybe 180 days to look at the different terpene profiles and how those, terp how those terpenes are volatizing um, during the packaging and, and during the at certain different aspects of the supply chain. Um, we're also going to be shooting a lot of really cool content. So any of the farms, distro companies that are involved, um, we're going to be gathering content from the farms, talking to farmers, talking about uh, what makes your products unique, what makes your farms unique, and, and why you felt it was um, compelling to, to donate to this cause. And then we're also gonna, we're gonna take that content and we're gonna follow it all the way through the supply chain. So the distribution companies that are working with us, we're gonna get some of that um, all the way until to the lab. We're gonna talk to the lab about some of the stuff that they've noticed with terpenes and terpene degradation and, and what those terpenes mean to them. And then finally to the end consumer, which is the veteran themselves, talking about how important it was that these donations were made to them and what it means to them. And I think it's gonna be some really great exposure for everyone that's working on this project um, you're getting some really great data points to understand how we can preserve those terpenes and we're all working on a really cool cause. Um, so Jake, if you got anything you want to add on that, please jump in. All right. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. We're so blessed to be here and be a part of this. It's funny. Um, you know, I've never uh, got, had the chance to meet Brian or Bob, but I've been using Boveda back when everyone else was throwing tortillas in their stuff and, you know, and, and apple peels and orange peels to keep our stuff going. And um, I actually was introduced to it through a friend um, that's a creator of a very high-end cigar, Lars Teton's uh, cigars. And so I had learned about this way back before it integrated into my life within cannabis. And a lot of people, if you don't know about MedVets, we're a 501c19 veteran designated nonprofit. We call ourselves a boots on the ground ministry. And we believe it's because you have to get involved in your communities to do this. We're based in Mendocino County, but we're all across the United States working with people in a lot of ways. And we actually just are opening our first inaugural base 
Um, here in Fort Bragg, California, we have a 15,000 square foot, what used to be a hospital, um, that's going to help us do opportunity housing for veterans and teach them a lot of life skills through a one-year life skills boot camp. Uh, one of the things we noticed was the, by the time we were gaining donations, I mean, cannabis originally started as a compassionate use product. This was with Brownie Mary, with Dennis Perone, with all the, the legacy people that have brought us to be able to have these type conversations. It was the idea that this medicine was coming directly off these farms to get to people. And if you look back really at like TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, and you look at the things, the terpenes that we're talking about saving are a big part of the entourage effect of the medicinal uh, effect that our veterans get. So the idea that they would get the least or the, 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 when it's finally so dry you can't sell it, now we'll donate it to someone, really changes the dynamic of this. And what we're hoping to do here as we work with farms across Emerald Triangle and across California is really to not only gain an understanding of their craft, their medicine, the things they work so hard on, um, but also to follow that chain like Ryan was talking about. We're going to follow that chain of custody to the end zone. There's a reason Budweiser puts a born on date on their beer now. There's a reason people care about freshness and things that they touch and do. And Bovida has proven throughout time to be an industry leader here. And so that's why we partnered with Bovida on this, um, this uh, challenge and this campaign. And we're, call, we're looking at it from an effect of being able to not only tell the story of the farmers who take so much time and care and love into their product, but so that that effect, when it gets to the end consumer, when it gets to a medicinal side, when it gets to someone else, they can depend on the same taste you have as a farmer when it comes off fresh and you're sitting there with your family enjoying your harvest is the same thing that your consumer is going to get, the same thing that your patient's going to get at the end zone. And so we're really excited, and, and there's a lot of great branding opportunities here to come together and really tell your story. And I think this is a neat part of what we talked about was this isn't just about gaining a pound donation or a donation here, a donation there, but really telling the story of the compassionate use, the compassionate act that's come back and the ability finally after we fought so hard and so many hours and people out there lobbying to get Senate Bill 34 to come through so that we could offer you a tax deductible receipt, so we could work with your farm. And so we're just very excited. We're looking forward to come meeting you guys on your farm, seeing what your heritage and legacy to this Appalachian products are, and really bringing that to the world that sets you apart from all these other brands that have a lot of money to push it out, but don't have that quality care like he was talking, that difference between mass cultivation and that cottage cultivation, that premium understanding of your product. And ultimately, we're here with the best of the best when it comes to that humidity control. Um, I was just looking at a product and I won't name the brand on it, but it was very interesting to look at a pre-roll here. And one of the things they say here, optimal storage, store in a cool, dry, dark place. Temperature should be between 41 to 70 degrees. Relative humidity should be between 55 and 62. Yet they don't have Bovida in there. Why they, This cardboard isn't going to do it. And we need to really take that moment. And I think the dollars and cents that was brought to us with uh, Brian and Bob really makes, a, a, whether you agree one way or another, dollars and cents in weight loss, water is weight, um, you know, and ultimately when we have it right, you guys, the, that hard work you put in, all that time you take to get to the end zone to harvest, to cure, do all those things perfectly right. Why would we then trust a system to go out and get to the end zone without having that system a little bit controlled, making sure that our consumers get that? And so we're just really excited to work with you guys, to, to meet a lot of you farms out there um, that want to help our veterans. Uh, our goal is to get this out into actually into dispensaries. So, and we're talking to Weed Maps right now about this to be able to designate this. And we want to be able to make sure that the veteran, instead of it being nebulous, can start to have somewhere they can depend upon to go get that free cannabis gift. And then eventually with enough of you farmers, the idea that we could supplement and help mitigate opiate dependency, the idea that we, someone could actually trust in a medical plan because we as a community have come together to create that availability. And so I just want to thank everyone, Natalyn, the HCGA, um, Bovida, um, you know, for the ability to be here and to be a part of this. And we really look forward to this year. It's going to be a great time and a lot of great, amazing content this year. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jake. It's awesome to have you on here. 
super exciting. I just want to let everyone know that I'm going to post a link in the Slack channel for the landing page for any of the farms or distros or any companies that are interested. Um, we've got a little bit of time before this is going to be implemented, but we want to make sure to get it on everyone's radar so that we have times to figure things out logistically. Um, it's not going to be easy for us to be sourcing from all these different farms in all these different areas. Um, but we're really excited about, you know, the momentum and where things are going. Um, again, if anyone has any questions on the, the donations or the piece that we're doing there or has questions as far as Boveda or our technology, um, I'm on Slack. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions for Brian or uh, Ryan or um, Bob? This was a really awesome presentation, folks. This is a good time to get any last minute questions answered. And I know I've muted folks, so I don't want to uh, prematurely cut you off. Tara? <laughs> I just want to say thank you, Bob. You made my day and I really appreciate you and happy anniversary. You're awesome. Thanks. <laughs> I wanted to point out, I put it in the uh, chat room. I don't know if it showed up, but uh, because this is a federally banned substance, there's been very few academic institutions that could work and study this. And so when we entered this market, we found the lack of science uh, based, you know, the independent studies that went on. So we have started that. And that's what really what Brian talked about. And he's got a number of others that are in the queue. And uh, we'll be revealing them as the results come in. So it's an exciting time for us in, in this world, be working with all of you uh, people that are involved in the industry. <clears throat> Well, with that, I think we're going to close up today's um, industry affairs call. I just want to remind people this was recorded. Um, we will make the recording available on our Slack channel. We are also have this recorded to our HCGA Facebook. Um, so we'll send out an uh, announcement to everyone. Uh, so if you have friends or partners that were not able to watch this because they were working, um, do make sure you're able to share this out. Um, Ryan is on Slack, reach out to him through there. Uh, Jake is on the Compassion channel on Slack. So if you have any questions, reach on out. And thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Let's have a great day. Enjoy that sunshine. Thank you. Happy Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody.